Hi, fantasy fiction fans, and welcome to Myth and Magic, a fantasy writer's kit bag. I'm fantasy writer Neil Mack, the author of Moondog and the Reed Leopard, and I want to share my love of folklore, local history, and nature mythology with writers and creatives like you on my regular podcasts. It's designed with fellow indie publishers and writers in mind, but all fans of fantasy fiction are very welcome to join in. In my fantasy writer's kit bag, writers, artists and creatives will find lots of ideas and discussion about things such as potions, dark arts, fabulous creatures, folktale studies, nature lore and the interesting history behind the myth and magic that underpins our understanding of the fictional universe. Hello fantasy fiction fans, at this time of year we can begin to think about Asgard fully. In Norse religion, Asgard was one of the nine worlds and home to the highest pantheon of gods, such as Odin, Frigg and Thor. Asgard is home to many named locations, the most well known being Valhalla, where half of all those who die in battle are sent. The remainder go to a meadow ruled over by the goddess Freya. Primary sources regarding Asgard come from the Prose Edda, written in the 13th century by Icelandic historian Snorri Sturluson, and the Poetic Edda, which is a collection of far older texts. Fall traditionally starts with the September equinox, 21st to 24th of September, and it ends with the winter solstice, 21st or 22nd of December. According to Bill Bryson, the English word fall, and also the English word harvest, can both be used to describe the season of autumn and were both used to describe the season of autumn right up until the Elizabethan period. The word fall was transported by pilgrims to the New World but it fell out of favour in England and in the British Isles soon after. The season of fall is associated with melancholia. I'm, I think, heading into my autumn of my life. So I'm um, lucky because I've um, reaping some rich rewards. I've got an abundant harvest. Towards the end of your life, you tend to uh, be rewarded with your various different uh, things that you've um, built up, your rewards that you've built up. But also, you know that you're gradually facing the darker days, the dark days of winter. So we often talk about uh, the autumn of somebody's life. The possibilities and the opportunities of summer have gone, and the chill of winter is now on the horizon. And Salman, Salman marks the end of the harvest season and the approach of the darker half of the year and the darker half of existence. So, towards the end of autumn was the time when the cattle were brought down from high pastures, perhaps to be overwintered or even slaughtered, and special bonfires were lit to keep the lights going. In Europe, fall is a season of cheer and beer, and fruits and abundancy, and warm bonfires. But it also comes as a warning, a warning that winter is on its way, and with it will come starvation, and harshness, and possibly even death. Which is why, at this time of the year, we think about the Asgard fall. Locus in quo. Bristol. So at the weekend, I was in Bristol to see my daughter and her other half. They live on a, in a fantastic house, one of the uh, what we call captain's houses, which overlooks the old harbour side in the historic part of this large town. It's the largest town in uh, the southwest. Ever wondered why pirates tend to speak in West Country English? Or in what's known as a West Country accent. Well, the English counties of Cornwall, Devon, Dorset, Somerset, Wiltshire and the city of Bristol and parts of Gloucestershire have their own distinct accent. It's called West Country English, or locally Mummerset. Edgar, in Shakespeare's King Lear, speaks in a West Country accent, as do several characters in Gilbert and Sullivan operettas. Hagrid, the giant, uses the folk speech of Zomazet or Mamazet, and some suggest that's because he lives or comes from an area similar to or near 
the magical forest of Dean. In fact, I'll cover this forest in a future show because it's so mysterious. Some academics suggest that the West Country English, or Mummerset, has more in common with Low German than it does in the British ac uh, English accent. For example, Ich bin is I be in West Country English, but most English speakers say I am. Du bist is the bist in West Country English, but most English speakers say you are. A distinctive element of the speech of West Country English is what's known as the rolling R. So yar means yes. So you should say Hagrid the giant uses the folk speech of Zummerzit, and some suggest that's because he lives or comes from the forest of Dean. I'm sure that's not perfectly right, but um, you get the gist. Also, uh, some of the West Country English vocabulary uses English words that most think come from a bygone era. Words such as hearken, which is lend an ear, are still in everyday use in the West Country and are uh, part of the Mummerset accent. Anyway, back to Bristol. And uh, the toponymy of the place, by the way, is the place at the bridge. The 13th century Bristol Harbour was a starting place for er early voyages of exploration to the New World. A ship out of Bristol in 1497, carrying John Cabot, who's a Venetian, became the first European vessel since the Vikings to land on mainland North America. Most probably he landed on Newfoundland. And you can see a replica of the Matthew in which John Cabot sailed to North America in the year 1497. If you visit the historic Maritime Harbour, go to the M Shed if you go. At the height of the slave trade from 1700 to 1807, more than 2,000 slave ships carrying an estimated half a million people from Africa to slavery in the Americas embarked from Bristol. During the 15th century, Bristol was the second most important port in the country and it was trading with Iceland, Ireland and southwestern France. It was a traditional starting place for many adventurous voyages. During the 16th century, Bristol merchants concentrated on developing trade with Spain and its American colonies. So Bristol's illicit trade in prohibited and smuggled goods grew enormously after 1558. During the Golden Age of Piracy, which is said to be 1690 to 1730, legendary pirate captains such as Robert Culliford, Black Sam Bellamy, Edward Teach, who's also known as Blackbeard, and also perhaps Calico Jack, Jack Rackham, uh, Mark Mary Reed, and others before and after these, either came from Bristol City or from the West Country counties nearby. And of course they use the West Country tongue, yar. So if ever you wondered why pirates speak in West Country English, that be it. International Talk Like a Pirate Day, by the way, you've missed it. It was September the 19th. Have you written or are you thinking about writing a fantasy fiction book with a pirate as a lead character or a pirate as a baddie? Let me know so I can share the news. Tweet me at Neil Mac or one word. Fabulous Creature of the Week As I prepare to travel to Whitby this weekend, up on the north east coast of Britain, I thought it high time to start a conversation about vampires. A vampire is a being from folklore that subsists by feeding on the vital forces, generally blood, of the living. The Persians 600 BC were one of the first civilizations to record tales of blood drinking demons. They described them as creatures that attempted to drink blood from men and pictorial evidence of this has been discovered uh, depicted on excavated pottery shards. In European folklore, vampires were considered to be undead beings that often visited loved ones and caused mischief. There have been reports from around the world over thousands of years of creatures that correspond to the description of vampires. And as gods and monsters suggest, a hoax is one thing, but the same hoax being played over and over again for a thousand years or more 
across independent cultures is entirely different. Bram Stoker's 1897 novel, Dracula, a lot of it of which was set in Whitby, by the way, is remembered as the quintessential vampire novel, and it provides the basis of the modern vampire legend as we know it, although it was published after Joseph Chaudin Lefebvre's 1872 novel, Carmilla. You probably won't be surprised to hear that the Holy Bible has mention of vampires. Proverbs 30.14 says, There are those whose teeth are swords, whose fangs are knives, to devour the poor from off the earth. And in the New American Standard Bible, Isaiah 34.14, The desert creatures will meet with wolves. The hairy goat will also cry to its kind. Yes, the night monster will settle there and will find herself a resting place. The origins of the vampire story normally begins with Ambrogio, which means immortal in Italian. Ambrogio is an adventurer who fate brought to Delphi in Greece during classical Greek times. But Ambrogio, although he was a human, he upset the sun god Apollo. So Apollo cursed Ambrogio so that his skin would burn if ever it would touch sunlight. Ambrogio later gambled his way into Hades to escape the uh, sun's deadly rays. And Apollo's sister Artemis, of Greek mythology, who is the goddess of the moon and hunting, made it so that Ambrogio's skin would burn even if it touched silver. Nonetheless, soon after this, when Artemis uh, took pity on the poor young man, she gave him the gift of immortality. So although he was human, he was now made immortal. Though he was destined to carry his curses, uh, his skin burning by sunlight or silver, and he would live forever in that form. Not only that, but Artemis gave him the, the speed and strength to, to become a hunter whose skills were second only to her own. Hematophagy, or blood-sucking, in case you were curious, was also included in Artemis's blessing. In the vampire origin story, Ambrogio hunts swans and uses their blood to write love poems. Protection from vampires has always been something worth having. Um, garlic is a common example and is hung above a door. A branch of wild rose or hawthorn is said to harm vampires, so you could keep them by the door to strike a vampire. And in Europe, sprinkling mustard seeds on the roof of a house was said to keep them away. Other items include sacred things, for example, a crucifix, a rosary, or holy water. In my house, I used to have uh, an elderberry outside my house. We have not got some garlic in our kitchen, but we have got some holy water in two of the corners of my main room. Vampires are said to be unable to walk across consecrated ground. So if you uh, are chased by a vampire, it's best to hide in a church ground or temple. And they're also said to be unable to cross running water. The information for this was found on www.gods-and-monsters.com. I'll put the link in my show notes. Vampires. Wildflower of the week. Conkers. With colder mornings and gusty winds, it's easy to find lots of lovely brown conker shells along the towpath by the River Thames. This afternoon, when I went down to the shops, I picked up two and stuck them in my pocket. Conkers, for those of you who don't know, is a traditional children's game played in the British Isles using the seeds of the horse chestnut tree. But the name conker is applied to the seed and to the tree itself. The game is played by two players, each with the conker threaded onto a piece of string. They take turns striking each other's conker until one breaks. If your conker survives six bouts, it was called a sixer, then it normally retard and you'd start another conker. When I was at school in the 60s, uh, conkers was one of the only games that we uh, had because basically conkers were free. I, I lived at a time when uh, people didn't waste money on toys. We didn't have uh, television. 
We certainly didn't have computer games. Uh, we had one or two toys like jigsaw puzzles and colouring books. So Conkers was a very exciting thing for us. It, conquer time was a very exciting time. I remember when I was about five, I was taken on an unplanned trip to, I think, Morden Park in about October, about the same week as this week. And I remember remember running over to a conquer tree that has sat in the middle of a very muddy field. And because the muddy field... Um, was sort of thickly gooey it looked as if nobody else had gone up to that tree anyway i went over to the tree and under the tree was a treasure trove of huge golf ball sized highly polished and wonderfully fresh conkers so i filled my uh, trouser pockets to overflowing then i filled my blazer pockets i had two outside blazer pockets and i think one inside pocket filled them up then my cap because in those days schoolboys wore caps um, and then I sort of obviously had to sort of think of somewhere else to put them. So I was like stuffing them down my pants and stuffing them into my socks. I wanted to bring back more and more, but I literally couldn't hold any more conkers. A strange sensation hit me as I frantically tried to pick up as many as these, of these amazing conkers as I could. I remember that sensation even now. I don't know what the feeling was at the time, but I do know now it was the feeling of avarice. I think it was my first and I think my only dalliance with cupidity. To allay any sense of guilt, I gave away almost all my brilliant conkers that I'd gathered under that tree that afternoon. I gave them to my friends at school. I kept the two biggest of those conkers, which incidentally were about the size of duck eggs for myself. And I kept those conkers for many months, in fact, probably over a period of a year. But I noticed they gradually shrunk into tiny, dry sacks of nothingness. Although they seemed to be part of the natural scale landscape of the British Isles, in fact, horse chestnut trees are not indigenous to Britain, but in fact the Balkan Peninsula. Conkers were probably first brought over by the Romans, but most widely planted as specimen trees from the late 16th century onwards. Therefore, there is little or no mythology or symbolism attached to those trees. Nevertheless, I've noticed that, along with the willow, uh, the conker tree is the first to go gold in autumn and the first to drop its leaves, and it's also the first to spring into bud in spring. It's said that if you place conkers around your house, it will keep away spiders, although this seems to be unproven and basically unlikely. And my mother believed that if you put conkers in uh, the drawer with your washed clothing, the clothes would keep fresh for longer. Aeschylus, Aeschylus species, which is the conker species, have stout shoots with resinous sticky buds. These days, the parrots, and we have uh, ring-necked parakeets along the Thames now, a consequence, I think, of global warming, uh, the parrots eat the buds. So when you walk under the trees in uh, kind of springtime, you often see lots and lots and lots of buds and uh, bits of leaf underneath the tree where the uh, parrots have pecked them away. Anyway, une uneaten buds later form into uh, what we call candles, which are long spikes of flowers. And when you look at those flowers individually, you see they're actually quite beautiful with white and pink and yellow parts. They look like orchids. In North America, the tree is known as the buckeye. All parts of the buckeye are moderately toxic and Native Americans used to crush the uh, conkers to make a mash that was then thrown into still waters to stun fish before they caught them. Ninth President of the United States, uh, William Henry Harrison, who was formerly of the Ohio State Senate, portrayed himself for election sitting in a log cabin that was made of buckeye logs and drinking hard cider and this caused Ohio to become known as the Buckeye State. Conquerors should not be confused with chestnuts, you know, the ones which uh, are warming on the far. These come from the beech family in the genus Castanea.